here too. God is good. One thing about life that I have found to be true over and over and over again many times, life hurts. You know, there's a lot of joys in life. But the truth is, life hurts. You know, there's two kinds of people in life. Victims and victors. Those that walk through the same situation and you think that they would respond the same, but they don't. Life hurts. It can be a big ball of hurt to rip you from the shell of the self that you actually are. Sometimes it's just little things that hurt. Sometimes it's words of jest. Have you ever had somebody joke with you and they went a little too far in the joke and it hurt? And you, it just kind of settled. It didn't sit right with you. and you, you took that to heart when really that wasn't their intentions. Sometimes it's inadvertent things that hurt your feelings. People are just completely unaware. I, I believe that most offenses, most hurts happen inadvertently. You know, people, most people don't intentionally want to hurt someone else. Uh, although there are the, the jaded, you know, the, the bitter hurt people that intentionally hurt others. That, that's not most of the case. A lot of the times it's just inadvertence that hurts people's feelings. Although sometimes it is intentional. You know, we've all been struck by those blows that somebody meant to hurt us by what they said, what they did. And, uh, and it did. I think those hurt even more because we know the motivation behind it was to hurt. Sometimes it's not us that's being hurt. Sometimes it's somebody that we love that has been offended or hurt. And we take on that offense for them by proxy, man. And it just, I, you know, it, you can see that the most with kids. When your kids get hurt, it hurts you to a new different level than it does if it's you getting hurt, you know. And I feel that way about my wife, too. You know, I can take a lot of stuff, but what, there's nothing to say bad about Jen. But if it hits Jen or Trey, man, it just hurts me to a brand new level. Literally, every single day, there are opportunities to be hurt and offended. Man, and it happens in life so frequently. But there's two kinds of people in life. There's those that deal with it correctly, and they become the victors or there's those that become victims. And the main thing that separates these two kinds of people is one word. Forgiveness. One word can separate you. It can actually separate you and distinguish your trajectory in life. The inability to forgive can actually tank the purposes of God in your life. Because we've taken this and it's gotten so heavy... Forgiveness. There's a guy I want to talk about briefly, and then we're going we're gonna to learn something. And every once in a while, man, a word just sits on me. And I, I've been grieving over this word this week. It's just been so heavy. Uh, the Lord woke me up in a motel room this week at midnight and just began to download this to me, just began to speak to me. And I believe this is for, I know it's for me, but I know it's for many people in here as well. You know, there's a guy in the Bible, he, he is like the picture of forgiveness. His name is Joseph. This guy is in incredible. And I know a lot of you know his story. We're just going to recap for a second. But let me tell you something. We know this man's name because he forgave. If he would have chosen the alternate route and would have held on to this, I don't think we would have ever really even heard the man's name. But because he learned how to forgive, he became a keystone in the destiny of God, not only in his own life, but in the entire course of the nation of Israel. This man was a dreamer, and he was always dreaming, always thinking up stuff, you know, God speaking to him. And I guess if he had one uh, downside, it would be that he talked too much. That's the downside of a lot of people, me primarily. Mouth runs about twice twice the speed that the brain does a lot. But God had spoken to him and said, hey, here's what's going to happen. The, the sun, the moon, the stars are going to bow down to you. And this represents your, your mom and your dad and your brothers. 
And he thought that the greatest thing to do would just to be telling everybody that this is, this is God. Look at this, guys. Look how wonderful this is. God spoke to me. All of you guys that love me so much, every one of you are going to bow down to me. Isn't God wonderful? They didn't quite get the same jubilation out of that download from the Lord that he got. And they just started hating him. And then furthermore, he was like the favorite of the children. You know, daddy was always buying him presents that nobody else got. He got this coat of many colors that was beautiful. And his brothers just started absolutely hating his guts. Anybody have a sibling? Well, don't admit that. Never mind. I have a great sibling. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let me tell you the path that this took, man. These brothers, they hated him. They took him and concocted a scheme. He must have really been shooting off at the mouth. Because he was talking so much that it led them to think, let's kill this guy and get rid of him. You got to really hate a brother to do something like that. But that was their scheme. So they did. And they took him and they, they threw him in a pit. And they took that coat that had become the symbol of the father's love and they, they covered it with like blood. And they went and told dad, hey, Joseph's dead. Just get over it. You got us. Man, how much do you have to hate a sibling to throw them in a pit and tell everybody else that they died. You know, there's times in life that we want to do that with the Lord. Say, hey, Lord, they're, they're just, they just passed on, you know. I took care of them. And then one guy, one of his brothers said, we're not going to let this happen. And he got this scheme. Let, let's take money for him. So it didn't just stop in this pit. His brother comes and they pull him out. And they decided that they're going to sell him into slavery so they can make a little something on him getting away. Isn't that wonderful? Not only do we hate you, we've told everybody you died. I want to get some uh, lucrative gain from you not being here anymore. You've just been a thorn in our side, Joseph. So they sold him into slavery. He went down to Egypt. And I know we're just jumping through this man's life, but this isn't the, the main thing where we're going here goes down to Egypt and he starts to get employed in a guy's house named Potiphar. And God just really starts to elevate him. Man, giving him favor in his life, just blessing him, blessing him, blessing him. But the problem was Potiphar's wife had, had it out for him in a good way, or well, in a bad way. She wanted him. That's what I'm trying to say. Tried to get him to be with her. And she's like, he's like, I'm not going to do that to my master. This is not integrity, that's not what a man of God does, forget it, I don't want no part of that, and he's working one day, and it's just him and her alone in the house, guys, don't ever do that, that's, that's a mistake, uh, that, that's, this is free of charge for a new generation, don't, don't be alone with somebody of the opposite sex that's not your wife, is that wisdom, yeah, I, I think that's wisdom, so they did that, and he was cleaning and doing his chores, and she tries to get him to lay with her. And he's like, I'm not going to have a part of that. So she rips his coat off, and Joseph did the wisest thing in his life. He ran away. Man, that's smart. Sometimes you can't beat the devil and all the temptations of the devil in your flesh. The best thing you can do is just run and get away. See, a lot of times we, oh, I'm strong enough to handle this. Run. So he ran, and he left his coat behind. What, man, the coats keep getting this guy in trouble. <laughs> so she tells her husband, this man tried to rape me, and I wasn't going to be a part of this, and he has him thrown in prison. Now, isn't this wonderful? This man who had nothing but a dream gets thrown in a pit, told he's dead, sold into slavery, lied about, and now he's in prison. Isn't, aren't you thankful that the joy of the Lord is your strength? Here he is, just life has hurt him. 
over and over and over and over again. Let me tell you something. In that prison, he had a decision to make. I can be mad the rest of my life because this isn't fair. And we all have those things that we think, this, this is not fair. This should not be happening. Or we can just pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, you know what? I'm going to keep on trucking. And there's somebody that needs to hear that this morning. It's time to pick yourself up out of the place that you're in and just make a decision once and for all. This is not going to get me. It's not going to take me out. This is not going to thwart the destinies of God on my life. It may hurt and it may be unfair and this is so unjust, but it will not defeat me. I think Joseph made that decision in a prison. And God began to use him in that prison, man. Elevate him in a prison. It's amazing that even in your own prison, God can bless you and elevate you in the place of your pain. So he does. But it isn't over yet. You know, Joseph is still trying to work his way out and somebody has a dream and he says, hey, do me this favor when you get out. Speak well of me. And he forgot about Joseph. So here he is in the prison. Years again. A couple of years more. Until it comes time for Joseph to get out. And then his destiny is going to be righted. He gets out of prison and God establishes him second in command of all of Egypt. Now that's awesome. Okay, starting with the dream through all sorts of pain. Let me tell you, beware when God starts to speak to you. Because our first modus operandi is when God speaks something good on us, we start seeing like the yellow brick road laid down in front of us with munchkins everywhere, just follow the yellow brick road. You know, it's just, oh, this is going to be a great journey. It's going to be so wonderful. Follow the, follow the, follow the, follow. No, sorry. It's just going to be so absolutely glorious. God has spoken. Look at this yellow brick road. God has laid it out before me. It's going to be so wonderful. And then all of a sudden, hurt, trial, pain, life happens. And all of a sudden, we start forgetting about what God spoke to us. But Joseph didn't let, him take, let, didn't let that take him out. Okay, that's just the beginning of the story. Because what happens is, as he's elevated in this place, God speaks. And he says there's going to be seven years of famine. There's going to be seven years of feast, followed by seven years of famine. So God gives Joseph this plan and says, here's what's going to happen during these years of increase, start to stack up things in silos and barns. I don't know if they had silos, but they, they did in this sermon. They have storehouses, and they start stacking it up. That way it will provide for you during the season of famine. Like, okay, God, God provides. So he speaks, and little did he know that that one act of obedience was going to bring that offense straight back up in his face. So this famine hit hard. You know, you think, uh, I mean, it's hot outside now. I imagine it's heat. It's just pestilence, man. Nothing's growing. There's no food. Back home where his brothers were. And all of a sudden, they start to hear that, hey, there's, there's silos full of food down in Egypt. Go down there, boys, and get us some food because I'm hungry. That's where that word came from. You didn't know that. Just a brief exegetical study of, of Genesis will show you that's the origin of that word. So they go down there, his brothers, and they come into the court, and it's Joseph presiding over the court. Now let's stop here for a second. You're Joseph, who has been picked on, abused, made fun of, despised, attempted murder, lied about, sold into slavery. And the last time you saw your brothers, they were padding their wallets with money that they made off of you being sold into slavery. And now they're in your palace asking you for something. 
Okay, let's stop super spiritualizing this for a moment and put yourself on the throne right at that moment when the person that jabbed you, that hurt you, that tried to kill you, that despised you is now asking you for something. What would you do? I'm not looking for a churchy spiritual answer. I'm asking you for the truth. I imagine there would be a tug of war going on in the brain of Richie. There would be the side that was screaming mercy. There would be the side that's saying, <laughs> Oh yeah, this is going to be good. But Joseph had made a decision a long time ago to forgive. How can you forgive someone of such a ludicrous, hurtful, shameful act that they did to him? But we know the story. If you don't read, man, it's awesome. In the last part of Genesis, in chapter 45, I'm just going to read a few verses. It says, Then Joseph, who could not control himself by all those who stood by him, he cried, Make everybody go out from me. So no one stayed with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not answer him because they were dismayed at his presence. That means scared to death. So Joseph said to his brothers, listen at these five words. Come near to me, please. Come near to me. Now that wasn't words that they were expecting to hear when they saw that it was Joseph. And they came near and he said, I'm your brother Joseph who you sold into slavery in Egypt. Shame on you. He didn't say shame on you. Now, do not be distressed and don't even be angry with yourself because you sold me here. Because God sent me here to preserve your life. My goodness gracious. I mean all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. We give the devil too much credit. The only way he can defeat the purposes of God on our life is if we submit ourselves to him and follow his path on our life. That's it. He doesn't have that kind of control over your life without our agreement with him. And here he is in front of his brothers and he said, Hey guys, come near. I don't care what you've done. Let me tell you, that takes some spiritual maturity right there to realize that this isn't even about you. This was God and I see his hand that's orchestrated this. And they got this great thing. They got his brother, the whole family. They moved him down to Egypt to the land of Goshen and God blessed them. And the last words we hear there is in Genesis chapter 50. Joseph's father died and now the brothers are still fearful because they don't quite get forgiveness yet. They don't understand it. Jacob's died, and they're thinking, okay, he's just been nice to us because daddy's still living. Now that daddy's gone, we're about to get it. And Joseph says these words that to me defines his life. He said, guys, stop worrying about that. What you meant for evil, God meant it for my good. I don't know what kind of hurt you're living in this morning. I don't know what type of pain you've been endured. Because I know you have been enduring some. Why? Because life hurts. It hurts. Man, you get thrown stuff sometimes that just like knocks the life out of you. Your story is different than mine. But all of us endure pain. My question to you is, 
how are you going to deal with it? Because God can still turn around and use the thing that hurt you the most for the good of the kingdom of God and the good of your life. How does that happen? Because God's the redeemer. See, he redeems all things. The problem is we get lost in that process somewhere. You know, we start devising our schemes in the pit and we decide, now, here's what I'm going to do. They're going to get it. I'm going to climb and get that dirt and mud underneath my fingernails, get out of this pit, and then I'm about to go off. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to steal their coats and cover them with blood, and I'm going to tell them that they're all dead because that's what life is about. You kill my dog, I'll kill your cat. Ha ha! You're laughing because that's how life goes. And that is the natural proclivity of the human mind. To stand in that place and say, guys, come on near. I know we've walked through some things that hurt. But why don't we just go ahead and set that behind us and just love on Jesus together? That takes faith. That takes spiritual maturity. And that's how he was. How do you live a life like that? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I invite you on the rest of this journey with me. But I'm going to tell you, this journey is not easy. You know, the Bible says before you build a tower, you need to count the cost. I want you to count the cost of this with me. See, we can see victim, victor. We can see forgiveness. We can see, okay, God meant it for my good. God can use this. But putting feet on it and walking that out is something completely different. And that's what I want to talk about the rest of our time together. How to live that crazy life. And I mean crazy is good. How do we do that practically? We're going to look to our Savior. Luke chapter 23, if you will. See, Jesus at this place. Man, he's so good. He is so good. Once you understand and see what it is that Jesus actually did. And religion falls by the wayside. Questions fall by the wayside when you feel love like that. Jesus arrested after living this innocent, perfect life. His only crime, quote crime, was claiming equality with God. Claiming to be the son of God and it ticked the Pharisees off something fierce. Blasphemer. They hated him. Man, they arrested him. They mistreated him. They convicted him and sentenced him to die. They took him and they beat him within an inch of his life. They mocked him and they put a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe mocking him in jest. Taunting him as they smacked him. All right, you're the son of God. Tell me what my name is. Tell me who hit you. As they beat him time and time and time again. Broken, empty, bloodied. But that wasn't it. They marched him to a hill. And they made him carry the cross that they were going to crucify him on. See, that's not our method of execution today, but just, just for sake here. I mean, imagine somebody already condemned to die on death row, and they're walking, walking a mile, walking a green mile. They're going to the chair, and as they go to the chair, 
they're forced to have to carry the electric chair that's going to kill them. How brutally torturous is that? And they get him on that hill. Somebody had to help him carry it because he was almost already dead. And they put spikes through his wrist, his hands, his feet. And they erected him into the sky, a bloodied mess. This is your Savior. Don't come to me telling me what hurt you. Because it doesn't compare to that. See, it's amazing the things that we let get on the inside of our hearts. And I'm talking about me. Man, it affects us. I just can't get over it. Every time that I start to think that I'm going to hold on to this, I get that picture in my face. And I realize that's who I'm following. This isn't about me. And as he's erected, bloodied and broken on a hill, being mocked, Two others who were criminals were led away and put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, they crucified him there. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. You got guards down there. If you look at the end of verse 34, they're gambling for his clothes, probably to make a profit off of them. The people stood by watching, and the ruler scoffed at him. He saved himself. Him, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God. Have you ever kick a man while he's down? Struggling for every breath. Bloodied. Gurgling blood. Crucified with spikes through his hands and feet. People making fun of him. In that state, being crucified, people reviling him up on the cross. Jesus utters words in that scene that haunt me. And they guide my life. Because in that place of brokenness, Jesus has the audacity to utter words that are incomprehensible to me. As he looks down through eyes covered in blood, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgive them. What are you holding on to so tightly, church? That image haunts me. It pushes me to be better than I am. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There's several things encapsulated in that phrase that I want to talk about the rest of our time together. Aspects of forgiveness. If we're going to live that kind of life, the first thing is this it has to be immediate. If you're going to live a life like that, forgiveness has to come immediately. I don't mean 
time needs to pass. That's one of the biggest lies that has ever been propagated on the world. I just need some time. No, time's not going to help that. It has to be immediate. When we moved in our old house, uh, the first house we bought, there was this beautiful little flower garden that we destroyed in a matter of months. It was had ivy around the outside, and there was these beautiful flowers that, anyway, they're gone. They're memories of yesterday. And I thought that ivy was, I always thought ivy was so pretty. Remember the first spring? It was about 10 foot from our house. That ivy, through the winter and spring, had gone from the flower garden and it started growing towards our house. And I thought, man, that is so pretty. That ivy is just beautiful. I love it. It looks like an English garden. I mean, it's gorgeous. And I let it go. Year two comes. It hits the base of the house. And I thought, wow. You know what? My house is going to look like Wrigley Field. And I'm not even a Cub fan. Sorry. I thought we were in Cardinal country. I was. We lived in that house for 13 years. And I remember the summer before we moved out. I decided to do something about that ivy. Because I realized what had happened. Let me tell you what this ivy did. That plant is so small. But that is one of the most satanic, (laughs) devilish plants. That plant had covered the side of our house. It didn't look like Wrigley Field. It had torn off the soffit and fascia of the house had grown in the attic. I don't get in attics for two reasons. One, this. Those little rickety wooden ladders are not good for this. Secondly, uh, mice live in attics. As soon as I decided to start dealing with this ivy, I get in the attic. We had a forest in our attic. And I had no idea. Don't look at me, man. Well, you need to take care of your house. But I do, okay? I did need to do that. But I thought it was pretty. In our extra bedroom, there was a curtain cover in this window. I had no idea. It had grown through the window had separated the window from the house and had a gap like that. And the plant was in that room. Some of you construction-minded guys are looking at me. I'm asking you to forgive me. What is the deal with that? Something that started out so small has become such a massive problem. Do you know how long it took me to deal with that ivy? Well, we sold the house, if that tells you anything. It was everywhere. If summer number one, I would have come along and just kind of cut that off, that would have taken all of about three seconds. But at summer number 13... It became a week-long project of me ripping this thing off. Had to get the house repaired because it had destroyed the integrity of my house. Such a small thing. So it is with forgiveness. If you don't deal with it right then and there, it's like that ivy and it starts growing. And it doesn't take long. It destroys the integrity of your home. And your life is absolutely destroyed. And it's become this massive thing that has taken over everything. 
forgiveness needs to be immediate. When something happens, if you have to talk yourself into it and say it out loud, I choose to forgive, I choose to forgive, I choose to forgive. Jesus on a cross, while insults are being hurled, while in pain, says, Father, forgive them. He doesn't say, "Ah, God, I know this crucifixion thing's from you. I'm just going to need a little time. That hurt my feelings. I'm just going to need time. I know it hurts because life hurts. But it has to be immediate. Are you with me this morning? It has to be immediate. Man, Jesus did that so masterfully. And you think, well, that's Jesus. I'm rich here. I deserve a little. No. If you remember, church, that's who we're following. Christianity is a path, a lifelong journey to look like Jesus. He's our goal. He's our leader. He's our savior. He's our friend. That's who we're following. Second thing. And closely to this as well, about it being immediate, you don't have to wait until you're not hurt anymore. See, that's a lot of things that go with the time. Well, I just need time so I can get over it. No, time's going to fester it. It's going to make it into a bigger thing than it is. I'm telling you, forgiveness is not ignoring something happened. Forgiveness is staring that hurt in the face and saying, I choose to release this. I'm hurt right now. You know, Father, I'm, I'm struggling for my every breath. The blood is drowning out my lungs. I'm dying here. But I choose to forgive right now. I'm not going to wait until this is over, then come back after the resurrection and say, guys, it's okay. I'm going to let it go right now. Now, see, that's another lie about forgiveness. Guys, just drop it. I know you're hurt. I know you're hurt and offended because life is that way. But it takes a conscious choice in the middle of that hurt to say, God, I release it. It has to be immediate. It doesn't have to wait until you're not hurt anymore third thing about forgiveness is this also closely related this is another big lie about forgiveness forgiveness does not require an apology or even remorse as a prerequisite I'm going to say that again because some of you didn't like that it doesn't require an apology or even remorse as a prerequisite see what we think is I can forgive them when they're truly sorry. Is that not true? Okay, they've hurt me. They're not sorry, so why should I forgive you? See, notice Jesus didn't say, guys, are you sorry for saying that? I really want to forgive you. But you just don't even seem to be sorry you did it. What? What? No. He didn't have to have that. He said, Father, forgive them while they're hurling insults at them, at him. Guys, that's powerful truth right there. If you're now, I'm not saying we shouldn't apologize. We should. If you know you've done something wrong, apologize and make it right. But, but it's not a prerequisite to forgiveness. I've tried to practice that in my life. You know, I appreciate the I'm sorry's. I don't have to have that because I realize something. Forgiveness is about me. It's not about them. And to choose to hold on to unforgiveness is like building a prison cell around yourself. Like, you know what? They hurt me. This will show them I'm going to be in prison for the next 30 years. That will really show them. You're killing yourself. Guys, it's just the truth. It's not a prerequisite. For forgiveness. And Jesus showed that on the cross. Let me ask you, how many at that point, priest, 
How many people that had yelled, crucify him? How many people that had smacked him and beaten him? How many of the guards that had driven nails through his hands at that point said, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, I really hate that I did that to you. Zero. Not one indication of remorse from anyone. The only remorse we see in the story is one of the thieves on the cross said to Jesus, Hey, this man's innocent. Hey, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? You know, we're thieves. We're deserving what we're getting right now, but you're innocent. Just re remember me. And the other one mocked him. And that's the only indication of remorse anywhere. But it didn't keep Jesus from saying, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Just forgive them. This one's not easy either. Number four, we alluded to this earlier. Are you with me still? Doesn't this hurt? Number one, it has to be immediate. Two, you don't have to wait till you're not hurt anymore. Three, it doesn't have to require an apology or remorse. Number four is this. It gives them the benefit of the doubt even when they don't deserve it. I mentioned earlier about the inadvertence of, of offense. Most of the things that... I, I'm not really an offense holder. I've never been that way. I don't want you to do this, but you could smack me right now. I'll have lunch with you tomorrow. Let's not practice that. That's not ever been something I've struggled with. But it wasn't just forgive them. Notice the second part of that. They don't know what they're doing. They thought they knew what they were doing. But Jesus says, God, don't hold it against them. They do, they're completely unaware. That would deal with most conflicts and offenses right there. If we just got that right. If we just gave people the benefit of the doubt. You know, how do we do that? Well, somebody says something that hurt their feel, hurts your feelings. And instead of going home and us having a pity party. And nobody's invited but me. Just kind of settle this. You know what? They didn't really mean it that way. That's not how that was meant. Well, what if it was meant that way? So, forgive them. Give people the benefit of the doubt. I know this is going to just absolutely shock everybody in the building. You are not the center of everyone else's world. And we're not all like getting together in a huddle saying, hey, how can we hurt? How can we hurt Chad today? I'm going to pick on Chad here for a second. I'm just going to use you. You look good today, so I'm going to use you. All right, you know what, Chad? Hey, guys, Chad, cover your ears. Man, he's just... Let's get together. What can we do to make him hurt? <laughs> no, that's not how people are, you know. People aren't like getting together trying to make us feel hurt intentionally. Nobody's against us. There is one that's against us. There's one enemy. And Paul said it's not out of flesh and blood. See, our enemy is one. Now he uses us to be pitted against each other, but guys, just give people the benefit of the doubt. And when it was advertent and they hurt people, just apologize and get it right. Go back to steps one, two, and three. Number five is this. And this one hurts too. All of this hurts. It hurt. You think it hurts to listen to this. It hurts to be woken up at midnight and get this from God. Like, God, can I sleep now? It never retaliates in kind. Forgiveness never wants people to feel what they made us feel.
See, that's the big stumbling block to forgiveness with a lot of people because we're hurt. We're dealing with a legitimate hurt. And our end to that is as soon as I see them suffering hurt, then it's equal. Justice has happened. And now we can be friends. Let me tell you a little thing about justice. Justice came when the blood flowed down that cross. That was justice. That brought justice back into the world. Justice is not exacting revenge on one another and trying to make each other hurt because we're hurt. Paul also says, vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. Can I be real honest? Because I've lied about everything else. <laughs> Just kidding. I have tried to be the exactor of God's vengeance in my life over and over and over again. It backfires, and every time my attitude was horrible. And it wasn't anything close to the heart of God. And it was my fault. Because I wanted people to hurt. Because they hurt me. Notice Jesus' response was, Okay, God, I know this whole salvation, atonement thing, but before that happens, uh, this hurts. Can you line me up about 300 crosses here? That I'm going to make them feel what I'm feeling right now first. No. Nope. No. If that one doesn't hurt, this one will. What number are we on? It pleads with the Father on their behalf. See, we get lost in the land of trying to get over it and let it go. True forgiveness is when we come to the Father on their behalf and say, and not, not only I want to forgive them, but Father, I'm asking you, the judge of all people, you know that person that stuck me in the heart and it hurt and I've been carrying this for so long? I'm asking you, God, show them mercy. Forgive them. I'll be honest, and you're like me because you're a human being. How much of your prayers, mine's about 99.9% .9 versus 0.1%. That's about that ratio. The 99.9% .9 encapsulates my prayers that's, Father, forgive me. The 0.1% is the Father, it ain't even about me. Release them. Forgive them. Mm. Man, that's hard to do. Isn't it? Man, it's difficult to do. Because we feel like God's like our ace in the hole. I might not be able to get you. But there's payday coming. Even if I can let it go, I can rest in the sweet by and by that God is going to get you and punish you for all the bad that you've done. You know what? I forgive you because I know it's coming. And God, oh, hallelujah, in that day, God, when those people that hurt me, you parade them through the streets of Calvary and beat them in front of every saint that's ever lived. Hallelujah! I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but if you think a little harder, you'll realize I'm telling the truth. Vengeance is the Lord's. And he's the judge, that's right. But you better believe he is the judge and he's going to get it. See, the true sign of forgiveness is even our posture towards the Father is, Lord, that hurt me so bad. But I love them, Lord, and I ask you that you release them, Lord. 
and you forgive them for what they're doing to me. Lord, I might be innocent in it. This isn't even about me. Show mercy. Mercy, God. Give them mercy. I don't like praying those prayers. Matter of fact, my flesh hates it. But Jesus loves it. Man, he loves it. He loves it when we take that posture. My next step is this. It only comes, that posture can only happen when we choose humility over pride. See, really, pride is the path. It, it's the obstacle of unforgiveness. It's because we're looking at ourself. We we'll make comments like, who do they think they are? Don't they know who I am? You will see something that when we are struggling with unforgiveness, coupled right along beside it, guys, I'm telling you the truth, we have a colossal pride problem. If I'm struggling with unforgiveness, I am also struggling with pride. And the only way to get to the path of forgiveness is to humble myself in the sight of the Lord. Am I right? It's true. What step are we on? I'm sorry. This is getting crazy here. I need to just get up here and see my notes. I've given seven, right? This is number eight. The last one. Everybody said. <laughs> I can't take any more myself today, and I don't think you can either. It's giving you a lot to chew on. This is the motivation for it. True forgiveness chooses relationship over offense. I've never had much in life. I don't have a lot of material possessions. I don't have something that the world would say that's a rich man. The most valuable thing in my life is relationship. It's you. It's people. And I'm not willing to waste a one of you. I love you. If I've ever hurt you in any way, I ask your forgiveness. Because I want to make it right. Because you're valuable to me. See, as Jesus stood up on the cross, he could take all of that because he loved them. And he knew the relationship that would come out of him walking through the pain. And he said, I choose you. Let's get it right. Better than get it right, make it right. If you're carrying something this morning, I implore you, make it right. I've given you the extremely difficult journey of walking that path that Jesus walked. But I believe it's the path for every one of us. Make it right today. Because people are worth it. And we can say, well, you know what, I'll forgive them, but I'll never, I'll never, never be close to them again. I'll, I'll never quite trust them again. Don't say stuff like that. You don't know that. That takes the healer out of play.
people are worth it. And as I've looked back over my life, guys, there's not one person that I'm willing to say I wished I never knew them. Wish that I never met them. Because people are the most valuable thing, not only to God, they're the most valuable thing you will ever, ever have. And if someone has hurt you, choose that relationship over holding on to that offense. Because it's not worth it. And if you choose the offense, let me tell you what's going to happen. That ivy is going to start growing in your house. And it's going to completely destroy everything in your life. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. It will destroy you as a person. No, I couldn't do that. It's just so small. It's not going to affect anybody. I'm telling you, that ivy was tiny. But it destroyed a home. That's what unforgiveness does. Man, Jesus did it right, didn't he? What a model. I fail at this 99% of the time. But that's the picture that haunts me in a good way. Because that's what I want to be. Father, forgive them. For I don't, they don't know what they're doing. Jesus, as we come before you this morning, Lord, I'll be the first to say, Lord, life hurts.